What happens when you mix romance and scamming? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, Sophie Catfish. Brian Rapley allegedly stalked Australian Love Island star Sophie Monk, but claimed to have been catfished by a con artist posing as Monk. Rapley arrived at Monk's house on the morning of April 25th, 2023 with a single rose. When she didn't answer the door, he peered through her windows and walked around her garden calling her name. Security camera footage caught Rapley placing the rose on Monk's door before walking away. Monk's neighbors informed her that a strange man was walking around her property. Having dealt with stalkers in the past, Monk alerted her manager who contacted the police. Rapley returned later that evening, but when he arrived, a swarm of five police cars instructed him to exit his vehicle with his hands up. The officers served him with a restraining order and took him to a local police station. Monk confirmed that she was happily married, had never been in contact with Rapley, and did not know him. The relationship began when Rapley commented on one of Monk's Instagram posts and received a message from a separate Instagram account shortly after. The Monk impersonator explained that her manager reads messages in her official account, so it was better to use her private account. She also said her phone wasn't working, so they could only speak online. Rapley had no problem with this and spent the next four months exchanging love texts and DMs. As their relationship progressed, a legal firm contacted Rapley to let him know that Monk had a significant amount of money on its way, but she needed to be married to receive it. The company urged Rapley to sign a temporary marriage certificate so she could access the funds. However, Monk already had a husband named Joshua Gross, but this didn't stop Rapley from engaging with the firm anyway. The company instructed him to send a photo ID with multiple documents and send money for the marriage. They also needed $7,000, which he was reluctant to hand over. While Rapley was skeptical, he complied with the firm's demands since he loved and trusted Monk. After months of talking online, the fake Monk sent Rapley her address and they arranged to meet in person. The scammer lied to him about those things, but they gave Rapley the real Monk's address. The police labeled Rapley as a stalker, but he shared the messages he exchanged with the catfish and that he'd lost $7,000 due to the scam. He'll appear in court for the restraining order in May of 2023. Number five, dying of a broken heart. A con artist scammed retired lunch lady Elaine Chamberlain out of her life savings by convincing her they were in love and would get married. It began when Chamberlain met a man online and quickly fell for him. She believed he was a man in his 60s that worked abroad as a diver on a ship. The relationship quickly progressed with her online love confessing that he was in love and wanted to marry her. Then the scammer asked Chamberlain for money to support his sick son and she obliged. Chamberlain's son, Richard, was aware that his mother had met a man online and was concerned. He asked her directly if she was sending the diver money, which she initially denied. Tragically, Chamberlain passed away in the midst of the scam. When the scammer video called her cell phone looking for more money, Richard answered and told the scammer that his mother had passed and that it was the scammer's fault. Chamberlain's refusal to believe that she was speaking to a con artist strained many of her relationships, including her relationship with her son. Richard and Chamberlain repeatedly argued over the situation, which took a a huge emotional toll on the mother and son. Chamberlain lost Danny, her partner of 31 years, when he passed away in 2013. He was the love of her life and she was lost without him. She was vulnerable when the scammer reached out to her and Richard was certain his mother was caught in a scam. Despite Richard's constant warnings, Chamberlain sadly refused to listen, but Richard couldn't drop it. So he looked up the man's profile pictures and found they were from someone else's Facebook profile. In spite of actual evidence, his mother still would not listen. Shortly after the confrontation, Chamberlain answered a call on loudspeaker while Richard was in the room. The man his mother spoke to had a very young voice and certainly didn't sound like he was someone in his 60s. In early 2020, Chamberlain received a call from the post office where she would go to send money that there was unusual activity in her bank account. She spoke to police officers who advised her that she shouldn't send this guy money and urged her to stop talking to him. Richard also tried to involve law enforcement, showing them receipts of money transfers and explaining what was happening. Since Chamberlain had 
had voluntarily sent the money, the police said there was nothing they could do. Richard tried to take control of her finances and notified social services and her bank about the situation. Although he put protections in place to stop her from sending more money, Chamberlain found ways to circumvent his measures by visiting money exchange centers to transfer money rather than the post office. Chamberlain's health took a concerning turn when she appeared to stop taking her prescription medications and wasn't consuming enough fluids. We don't know why she stopped, but we can't help but think it was because she had finally accepted that she was scammed. Richard visited her and said he'd call her doctor, but a few days later, she was rushed to the hospital with cellulitis, a bacterial skin infection. Family members gathered at the hospital, and the scammer FaceTimed Chamberlain's phone while they were there. Her son answered, telling the scammer that his mother had passed away and it was their fault. Chamberlain had suffered multiple organ failures and passed away shortly after being admitted. Richard eventually found a wedding dress and two rings in her bedroom and discovered pictures she'd sent of herself wearing the dress to the heartless scammers. Throughout the scam, she sent $25,000. At the time of her passing, she had 150 bucks left in her account. Number 4. Inherited Wealth New Zealander Aileen Wood fell victim to an online scam where she sent $41,000 of her inheritance to a man from Facebook. Nathan Salvatore reached out to Wood on Facebook in 2013, and the two were soon communicating regularly. Salvatore said that he was a building engineer and an American living in England who was working in Malaysia at the time. Salvatore told Wood that his wife had passed away and sent Wood's pictures of his children. While Wood communicated with Salvatore, she was still married to her husband. Despite her marriage, status, Wood and Salvatore talked all the time, but only through emails and instant messages as he avoided video calls. Wood had recently lost her mother when Salvatore first messaged her, making her feel sympathetic to his situation. The pair connected over their grief, although one detail of Wood's story seemed particularly interesting to the scammer. Wood's mother had left her daughter a substantial inheritance. The scammer asked for money, claiming he had sustained an injury on the job and urgently needed funds for his medical bills, saying he would pass away without her help. She sent him the money, slowly draining her $41,000 inheritance. Salvatore kept sharing pictures of his family and other images of himself to create a sense of authenticity. Wood also received emails from a woman claiming to be Salvatore's daughter. Wood eventually sent the entire inheritance, but that wasn't enough. Salvatore asked her to send more money, so she took out an $8,000 line of credit. Once he had his money, Salvatore disappeared, ceasing all communication. When Salvatore eventually reappeared, he told Wood he needed money for surgery, but she refused. His reaction was hostile, and their relationship ended with Wood in financial ruin. Wood and her husband had to rebuild their finances after the scammer nearly wiped them out. Additionally, New Zealand's Ministry of Social Development reduced Wood's benefits by $100 weekly, considering the money she sent overseas as a loan. Number 3. MulesOnly.com Online scammers tricked an Aussie woman who's going by the pseudonym Tracy, since she didn't want to be identified, into trafficking luxury items. Tracy met the scammer on the dating website Badoo.com, where she met a man named Mark Gavin Cole. Mark claimed he was Swedish and working in Sydney, and their relationship moved quickly. Despite never meeting in person, Cole declared his love for Tracy, which she reciprocated. After losing her partner of five years, eight months before meeting Cole, Tracy was ready for love again, but was in a fragile place. She ignored warning signs, like the fact that the supposed Swedish man spoke with an Asian accent. Tracy agreed to let Cole send a few packages to her home, which contained watches, backpacks, and men's designer clothes. Cole sent several other expensive items of women's clothing, which he said were gifts for her. A month into their relationship, Tracy received a package that she sent on to Bangkok, spending $67 for delivery. The Thailand-bound package contained watches, hair clippers, and a camera. Soon, Tracy was unknowingly trafficking luxury items, with a constant stream of shipments showing up on her doorstep daily, and her request to stop them being ignored. Then, a shipment dock had arrived with the items purchased on a credit card in her name, despite her not possessing a credit card. Tracy immediately notified the police about the situation, and they launched an investigation into the scam, but they were never able to make an arrest. Number 2. Homeless Begging Scammer Susan Geary received gifts and stole from a 72-year-old widower by pretending she was in love with him. 33-year-old Geary befriended the widower while he was in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Geary posed as a homeless beggar and told him sob stories so he would give her money. Geary claimed she needed cash for accommodation, food, medical appointments, and stolen belongings. The man initially gave her small sums of money, but as her sob stories got more intense, he gave her larger amounts. Over several months, the man had 
gifted her $56,000. Despite faking gratitude when she was with the widower, Yuri would complain to her partner whom she lived with on days her victim didn't give her as much money as she wanted. Although he felt sorry for Giri, the man stopped giving her cash. In response, she stole his debit card and cell phone, which he thought he'd lost. Giri then helped herself to $9,990 out of his account. The victim's daughter, who had power of attorney over one of his accounts, warned her father against continuing to communicate with Giri. His daughter also was concerned about his relationship with the woman that she installed security cameras. She also changed his phone number, but received multiple calls from his bank saying he was there with a young female and wanted to withdraw money. Soon after, surveillance footage showed Gary taking out money using the victim's bank card. The victim had already grown suspicious of Geary, whose stories were becoming overly dramatic. She tried to back up her stories with documents that claimed she owed cash for civil claims, compensations, and rebates. But the victim knew they were fake. After seven months of giving her handouts, Geary turned up at his doorstep asking for more money. He refused. He got heated and picked up a rock, threatening to throw it at his windows. He went to an ATM to get her $60 and called the police when she left. Geary was quickly arrested and tried. She she defended her behavior in court, saying she used the money to buy illegal substances for her abusive partner. Her lawyer highlighted that Gary didn't spend the money on luxury items, but instead used it to purchase illegal substances as she struggled with addiction. But the judge and prosecution had zero sympathy for Gary. Apparently, Geary had already received a 12-month community order with drug rehabilitation after committing an almost identical scam. Geary showed little remorse during the trial, and the judge sentenced her to 22 months in jail. Before we get to number one, if you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here for our past release to find out how he married into a billionaire family. Number one, no one is immune. Radio personality Mel Gregg fell victim to a scam perpetrated by a man she would met on Tinder. After finalizing her divorce, Gregg gained the confidence to start dating again when she met a charming man on the dating app. But after spending a few days at her home and loaning him money, he vanished. The pair matched on the app and shortly after, he sent her a friend request on Facebook and struck up a conversation. The man claimed he played rugby and worked in sales when when she looked him up, she discovered he was a successful high-level sales executive. Gregg made him send her a picture of himself with the day's newspaper before their first date, worried he was a catfish. They met on a Friday night for dinner, and she was drawn to his charisma. The date went so well that he spent the weekend at her house. He claimed he couldn't find somewhere to live, so she offered to let him temporarily move in. However, things changed on the third day of being under the same roof. The alleged sales exec asked Greg to loan him $1,000 as he'd lost his debit card. She'd seen one of his paychecks and believed he was wealthy and didn't mind letting Sending him the money. But the next day, he went to work, leaving his belongings at Greg's place, and never returned. He blocked her on social media and blocked her number. Greg, being a public figure, talked about what had happened to her radio audience. Over 100 women contacted her to say they'd fallen for the same swindler, with one woman losing $70,000. Law enforcement could do nothing as they all willingly gifted the money to the scammer. Since the ordeal, Greg has shared her story to deter other women from falling for dating scams and advocate for those who have. In May 2022, James Stunt, socialite and ex-husband of Formula One heiress Petra Ecclestone, was one of eight people charged with money laundering in a massive scheme that laundered millions through Bradford Jewelers. 40-year-old Stunt made his millions by partnering with the Bradford gold dealer Fowler Oldfield to launder 266 million pounds between 2014 and 2016. They moved the cash in sports bags and luggage, using it to buy large amounts of gold from two vendors in Birmingham, UK. The staff at their bank grew suspicious and alerted the police, who quickly launched an investigation. Stunt's company, aptly named Stunt & Company, also received some of this cash in the amount of 46 million pounds. Conveniently, one of Fowler Oldfield's directors became a vice president at Staten & Company and made the scheme go national. Stunt & Company is classified as a gold bullion business, which means it purchased and sold gold from its reserves for a profit. Part of Stunt & Company's scam started by selling silver and telling people it was gold. It might be easy to blame Stunt, but he's not the only one. There are eight defendants in this case, 
and most of them worked at Fowler Old Field. Stunt, who walked out of the courtroom with a middle finger raised to the crowd, spent years trying to seem mysterious. He always wore a slight smirk on his face, which looked like he was hiding some big secrets. He was chauffeured around the West End in a massive array of blacked-out cars led by security guards in black suits and earpieces. He had two Rolls Royces, two Range Rovers, and a Lamborghini. He drove them around town and left them outside while he went to Sotheby's to purchase near priceless pieces of artwork. He had some quirky habits as well. Stunt always carries an Evian water bottle containing water, lemon, cayenne pepper, and maple syrup. Someone asked why he always brings his own water. He said it was because someone might poison him. He wears pale foundation, mascara, and lip gloss, which he continued to don in his court proceedings, paired with a shiny suit. Part of his mystery came from the fact that he became a multi-billionaire in his mid-30s, and no one knew where all of this money came from. Stunt tried to come off as a James Bond-style classy businessman, but that doesn't line up with his behavior behind closed doors. Stunt's trial for money laundering was scheduled just after the demise of his marriage to billionaire heiress Petra Ecclestone. Ecclestone was born in Westminster, London, England, as the youngest daughter of the English Formula One billionaire Bernie Ecclestone. Bernie is the former chief executive of the Formula One group, which manages Formula One racing and partially owns Delta Topco. Bernie was responsible for selling television rights for Formula One racing and managing the Formula One Grand Prix, both of which earned him a fortune. He quickly became one of the wealthiest men in the UK with a net worth of $3.3 billion. At 14, Ecclestone contracted viral meningitis, an internal virus that can cause fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, lack of appetite, fatigue, irritability, and much more. The symptoms can get quite severe. Ecclestone was hospitalized for the illness and apparently came close to passing away. She says the experience completely changed her life. She became a self-proclaimed health freak and a hypochondriac after recovering. She later became an ambassador for the Meningitis Trust. Ecclestone grew into a successful woman in her own right, apart from her father's massive fortune. At 19 years old, she leveraged her presence in the public eye to create a menswear brand called Form, which is sold in the popular UK retail store, Harrods. However, the company shut down after just 14 months of operation. In 2009, she she signed a contract with Croatian clothing company Sissia. In 2011, she released a line of accessories under the brand name Stark, including handbags with 24 karat gold detailing. Ecclestone has a net worth of $400 million. In 2006, Ecclestone went on a blind date with Stunt. They claimed it was a case of opposites attract, while friends and family predicted that their differences were too great for it to ever work out. He liked to live in mystery. Meanwhile, she was very public. His weight was always fluctuating. She was a health nut with a rigorous workout and diet routine. He allegedly battled addiction and chain smoked cigarettes. She was sober. The one thing they had in common, though, was that they loved to flaunt their wealth. Five years later, they got married. To no one's surprise, they had an extravagant $12 million wedding fit for a billionaire businessman and a millionaire heiress. Then, 22-year-old Ecclestone wore a Vera Wang wedding dress worth 80,000 pounds. She arrived at the wedding in a vintage Rolls Royce driven by F1 driver John Alisi. She began her journey 30 miles away in Rome in a white Rolls Royce Phantom and switched cars before arriving. They had a religious ceremony and flew in several members of the Royal Royal Philharmonic Orchestra to harmonize the nuptials. Several celebrities were in attendance, including Paris and Nikki Hilton, the Duchess of York and her daughters. The lavish ceremony was held at the spectacular 15th century Odescalchi Castle in Italy, the same place where Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes got married years before. The following reception was full of toasts with vintage crystal champagne, acrobatic shows, and fireworks. Andrea Bocelli serenaded them with his romantic hits, Time to Say Goodbye, Somos Novios, and Can't Help Falling in Love. Eric Clapton sang to them for their first dance as man and wife. The Black Eyed Peas performed afterwards for a lofty fee of one and a half million dollars. The night concluded with another breathtaking fireworks show. The same year, they purchased the Manor Mansion, one of Los Angeles' biggest private homes, also known as the Spelling Mansion. It was built in 1988 for television producer Aaron Spelling and his wife Candy. 
The exterior is made of imported limestones, and the interior is adorned with European fixtures and artwork. The manor is a French-style chateau mansion with over 100 rooms, including 27 bathrooms and 14 bedrooms. At 56,500 square feet on five acres of land, it's bigger than the White House. There are koi ponds, a wine cellar, a citrus orchard, a bowling alley, multiple pools, and a barber shop. When it was first built, it included a screening room, gift wrapping room, flower cutting room, a tennis court, and an ice rink. It even had a room for Candy's prized doll collection and an entire wing dedicated to her wardrobe. There are 16 carports and a driveway that can hold over 100 vehicles. In 2006, Aaron passed away at home. In 2011, the widowed Candy put it on the market with an asking price of $150 million. Ecclestone bought it for $85 million, then did $20 million worth of upgrades. She removed chandeliers, wall lights, and fireplace mantles. It took a team of 500 workers nine weeks to install her new furnishings. But the happy couple's relationship took a turn in the new home. Ecclestone realized Stunt's unhealthy spending habits and frequent violent rages. He spent more than 800,000 pounds on Lamborghinis during their marriage. Many of his purchases were made with her money. In 2016, Ecclestone decided to sell the home for an astonishing $200 million. It was on and off the market for a few years before selling for $120 million to Canadian billionaire and Edmonton Oilers ice hockey team owner Daryl Katz. At the time, it was the highest priced sale of California real estate. In February 2022, the manor was put up for market again for $165 million. Over the first few years of their marriage, Ecclestone and Stunt had three children together, including a set of twins. But it wasn't a fairy tale romance. In 2017, Ecclestone reportedly locked herself in a bathroom during a violent fight with Stunt. In February 2017, Ecclestone moved out of the family's home with their three children. She filed for divorce shortly after. Ecclestone wanted to return to the house owned by her family's Bambino Trust. The judge ordered Stunt to move out immediately. Stunt stormed out of the courtroom and gave the middle finger to photographers on the way out. He drove off in a Rolls Royce daunting a vanity Stunt-style license plate. As part of the hearing, the judge ordered the repossession of several of Stunt's luxury cars, including a Lamborghini with expensive golf clubs in the front seat. The couple signed a prenup worth 16 million pounds before their marriage, including some of Stunt's assets like a wine collection worth millions millions of pounds. At the time of the court proceedings, the manor in Los Angeles was one of the assets being fought over, which was later awarded to Ecclestone. Their divorce was far from amicable. They continued to publicly attack each other in the media for years after. Stunt claimed that his wife changed entirely after their marriage. Meanwhile, Ecclestone claimed that her husband was addicted to illegal substances. After the marriage evaporated, Stunt's bank account suffered because he no longer had access to father-in-law Bernie's fortune. He declared bankruptcy in 2018 and his assets were frozen. Many of his million-dollar estates were repossessed. Stunt then claimed he was robbed of $126 million of cash and jewelry in the hopes of a payout. He also apparently lent forged artworks to the royal family. But after being married to the daughter of a multi-billionaire and living in the biggest home in Los Angeles, Stunt was more than used to a life of luxury. Desperate to maintain his billionaire lifestyle, Stunt resorted to the infamous money laundering scam that brought him back into court. Without much of his own wealth, Stunt persuaded his father-in-law to give him a $10 million guarantee to lease gold from a bank for a gold bar production operation. He doused one kilo of silver bars in glint to make them look like gold and sold them at the going rate for gold, which is much more valuable than silver. Since the money earned from this operation was illegal, Stunt started a money laundering scheme to make it look like his fortune was on the books and avoided paying taxes. As much as Stunt tried to deny allegations of money laundering, one video the video seemed to confirm it all. Leaked by The Independent, a short clip and photograph show the CCTV behind the scenes footage of Stunt's office in which four people can be seen standing at a circular table counting stacks of criminal cash. They are surrounded by piles of Scottish notes as they funnel them into a banknote counting machine. Prosecutors claimed the photo was taken at the Mayfair office for Stunt and Company in February 2016 and was sent by one of the eight defendants to a co-worker via WhatsApp. In the image, you can clearly see Stunt's older brother Lee seated in front of the counting machine. 
Unlike his younger brother, Lee was much more agreeable and approachable and lived a modest life with his wife. Lee was chief operating officer of Stunt and Company and was found deceased at his parents' home, the Wentworth Estate in Surrey. The cause was speculated to be an overdose, though no official reason has been released. Some believe that Lee took himself out with the knowledge that he and his brother's criminal enterprise was about to be uncovered. Sure enough, mere days after his death, police raided the offices of Stunt and Company. More CCTV footage brought before the court showed a man delivering a bag full of cash wrapped in black garbage bags. He took his hat off and used it to wipe the bags while two other men counted the money. They washed the money through Fowler Oldfield in Bedford, West Yorkshire, and apparently used the cash to buy gold. The scheme went national when Fowler Oldfield's director, Greg Frankel, became vice president of Stunt & Co. Stunt was living out of the country at the time, but insisted on a very hands-on approach. Several text exchanges between employees were shown to the court, many of which which emphasized Stunt's desire to increase profits. Though not involved in the day-to-day -day management of Stunt & Co., he delegated much of his dirty work to others. In court, Stunt said he was unaware of what was happening within his company and played dumb by insisting he hadn't been keeping up with the emails that ultimately incriminated him. But his employees begged to differ. By the time the scheme was uncovered, more than 266 million pounds had been washed through Fowler Oilfield. Nicholas Clark, the prosecutor in the case, ripped apart Stunt's mysterious persona, saying that he was nothing but a fake. While Stunt's website claimed he made his fortune through successful business ventures, nothing on his resume added up to the wealth he claimed to have. Clark pointed out the differences between Stunt's tax and business records. He said that if Stunt was the independent businessman he claimed to be, he wouldn't have needed Bernie Ecclestone's $10 million for his new gold bar business. Clark claimed that Stunt took advantage of his wife's wealth and connections to establish himself in the business world. Stunt claimed he had no knowledge of the issues reported by Stunt & Co's auditor and claimed the report was incompetent. Stunt defended himself by saying he wasn't in touch with the other defendants involved in the scheme. This included his childhood best friend, Alex Tullock, who had a background in private banking and was supposed to be making sure they weren't laundering any money. Stunt also claimed that he didn't find out until the police report how much money was being funneled through his company. But Clark said Stunt received direct profits from 50,000 pounds to 250,000 pounds. He also cited multiple money transfers from Ecclestone's account into his, showing his dependence on her wealth. Stunt wrote checks and made charitable payments in massive amounts. Clearly, he didn't know how to live modestly. Clark also made allegations against Fowler Oldfield's accountant, Heidi Buckler, who knew of the large amounts of cash being delivered to Stunt's office. Several emails and messages were revealed that she was falsifying transactions to make the cash profits align with the weight of the gold, ensuring the money was laundered correctly. Clark made more claims claims against another defendant, Haroon Rashid, who was seen in CCTV footage delivering bags of cash to Stunt's office. He was listed as the director of Rashid Jewelers Limited, which had no apparent shop or workshop. Clark told the jury that Stunt & Co. was wiping down surfaces long before the pandemic, when there was only one reason to do so. Stunt claimed to take a very hands-off approach to the business, but text and email exchanges prove otherwise. Five of the eight defendants in the case, Greg Frankel, Daniel Rawson, Paul Miller, Heidi Buckler, and Haroon Rashid said the prosecution couldn't prove that the cash was criminal property. The other three defendants, James Stunt, Alexander Tulloch, and Francesca Soda, said they didn't know whether the cash was illegal. All eight denied charges of money laundering. During the highly publicized divorce proceedings between Stunt and Ecclestone, Stunt insulted her entire family, including her wealthy father. He mouthed curse words and made a gun gesture towards Bernie, and even tried to punch him. Shortly after Lee's passing, Stunt's behavior took a turn for the worse. He behaved erratically inside and outside the courtroom and was incredibly violent and abusive towards his wife. Bernie told the media that Stunt once tried to take his life. He apparently hated Stunt for quite some time, but avoided getting involved because he didn't want to damage his relationship with his daughter. Many of her friends rooted for their divorce for a while. In 2015, Stunt was involved in another court case when his former butler, Carl Hadjik, claimed that Stunt called him names and pushed him into a wall at the manor. Stunt denied the allegations, but this behavior is consistent with what Ecclestone's lawyers also said about his actions. Ecclestone's lawyer claimed that Stunt admitted to abusive behavior and several drug overdoses, which Stunt denied. The day after the judge ordered him out of the manor, Photographers caught Stunt leaving in the back seat of his Rolls Royce, smoking a cigarette, and holding a porcelain cat with another in his lap. He was still wearing his wedding ring. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you think the biggest red flags are when it comes to an online dating.
dating profile. 